What would be the superior combatant? Plap, squishy, pain-feeling flesh monsters from Anomaly, or the chat, cold, unfeeling machines from Biotech? We'll find out the answer to that as we fight against the overwhelming numbers of flesh monsters while controlling our own personal machine death squad, bathing the monsters in holy flame, and shotgun fire. This way we'll be combining the Biotech DLC with the new Anomaly DLC. Our ideology would of course be transhumanist, because we were obsessed with mechs and other high-tech stuff. The members of this colony were part of a fully staffed research ship in search of a mysterious signal from a distant rim world. Once there, people on board started to transform and the ship was shot down by an energy beam of some sort, resulting in our four survivors crash landing near this here river. The survivors were Tornikos, who shall henceforth be known as Mechlord, Cosma, also known as Mr. Cook, Theorus, known as Miner, and last and very much least, a disgusting raw flesh consuming zombie, which supposedly was very dangerous in melee combat, which we affectionately called Vegetable, cause you know, he's incapable of higher thoughts, but also only eats meat. Anyways, don't get too attached, we'll not be seeing much of him. When we landed, we immediately started carving out a tunnel and a room in the rock nearby. This rock would totally be adequately sized to house our base. While continuing to carve out more rooms in this defensive rock, we got the following message three days into our survival. Where we were notified that the mysterious monolith was starting to morph into a spooky monolith which would begin the invasion of the flesh monsters. Four days in, I was allowed to show my complete lack of creativity by naming our colony Metal Superiority, and our base No Flesh Creatures Allowed. We then spin around the facts in this one, we made sure everyone would know exactly what we were about the second they encountered us. On our fifth day, we were getting raided by a teetotaler waster who needs drugs to survive. Strange, but she was pretty good at crafting, so unbeknownst to her, she would become the first new addition to our colony. So a few shotgun shots later and she was ours for the taking. Raiding us would be the best decision she'd ever make. Hey, remember when I told you you shouldn't get too attached to vegetable? Well, here's why. It was a faithful evening seven days into our crash here, and while doing some manual labor, Mr. Cook was being hunted down by a lynx. No problem, I thought, our dinner is coming to us. So I sent Vegetable 4 to tank a few scratches while our 9 shooting skill trigger Happy Cook shot at the Lynx point blank. Too bad Mr. Cook couldn't hit a shot to save his life though as he managed to miss 16, 16 times. times in a row. At the same time Vegetable also only hit the thing a pathetic 2 times. Yeah yeah, very dangerous in melee combat, my ass. After making some distance, Mr. Cook finally managed to hit the thing. A round of applause for everyone involved here, competence at its finest. Shortly after this, the monolith turned spooky where a dark vision told us to study the thing to find a gateway to a dark dimension. At the same time, an Imperial Dame was being hunted down by the most dangerous game of all. A rabbit, so it's rabbit season. With rabbit season over, I was given a free title from the royals on this planet for my truly heroic actions. The title went to our main character Mechlord, or soon to be Mechlord, since no one here was more psychically sensitive than others. When we completed our bestowing ceremony, we got Solar Pinhole. Absolutely worthless. No meditation for you. At midnight, with our first encounter with a flesh creature, a side stealer, which is relatively weak on its own. I quickly set up a spike trap, London shanked the thing, and boom, we had our first live entity to chain up and study. Side note, is it me or does the capture icon kinda look like someone holding guts in his hands? Anyways, with the entity chained up, we could study it and start slowly unlocking a multitude of research projects. First off would be the Bioferrite Extraction and Harvesting. Now you might be wondering, what is this illustrious Bioferrite? Well, it's a special monster juice that is used for just about anything, from flamethrowing assault rifles to battle axes, from very scientific rituals to building floors and walls. It's basically just miracle juice. 
The next morning, I decided that this was as good a time as any to start becoming a mech lord. So we beat the shit out of an ancient exostrider, collected its transponder, made a long dead mechanator crash land, and lured a singular scorcher guarding the corpse over to a few tribals that were passing by. With this done, mech lord actually became a mech lord. During all this, we started the construction of a water mill generator, which was the whole reason we crash landed near a river. While installing some wall lights, a mysterious stranger wanted to join the colony. Chernoff was a woman with a gimmick to turn a corpse into flesh creatures, but I didn't question it. I had need for more labor, and since her stats weren't terrible, she was allowed to join. With power secured, it was time to start gestating a mech army. For now consisting of tiny militors and a bunch of menial labor bots. While doing this we got confirmation of how abysmally shit ghouls are, because one of them lost mano in mano from a random Neanderthal. It wasn't even close. While consuming a meal, Chernoff decided to kill my only test subject because she was hungry. Okay, now we had to go capture more test subjects. But hey, at least soon after we finally recruited our designated crafter tail, so within a few days we'd massively increased our colony's labor force. Since we didn't have enough bedrooms for every colonist though, Teo would be sleeping inside the freezer for a quite considerably long time. But she never seemed to complain, so she would just sit there no problem. If it ain't broke... With a whole lot of not much happening for two weeks, I added extra containment platforms, carved out large parts of our inadequately sized rock home, and started work on a large mech lab slash fabrication bay. This was until a hole in the ground opened up where two new test subjects came a running towards our colony. They were easily taken care of, though only one of them survived. With that nuisance out of the way, we could finally start making our mech army, starting with two Militors. They really weren't that bad against the flesh creatures, since they usually swarmed in with overwhelming numbers of weak, usually one-shot flesh monsters. Needing more test subject, we decided to provoke the Void, as they called it, to lure more flesh creatures our way to capture and study. This provocation was done in the most scientific way possible, where we stood in a circle around a naught pentagram, chanting... scientifically. This resulted in the most pitifully weak creatures to arrive at our colony, the Gore Hulk. Disgusting, bloated, spiky sacks as shite, shooting weak projectiles at us. They were durable for sure, but got incapacitated easily, which meant that all of a sudden my containment area was full. Now we could get sciencing. Later I got a quest. What's this? A masterwork nerve spiker for a rate of only 8 tribals? Sign me up! Damn it, why won't it read? Ooh, I get two meat shields as well. Can this quest get any easier? Oh, they're impits. That's annoying. Hey, stop setting the place on fire, you dickheads. Well, that went okay. Only one colonist and one militor went down and oh. There's more. Having barely doused the fires from the first group, the second group already made its way to us. Here I made use of Chernoff's ability for the one and only time this run, since you can clearly see how utterly pathetic it was. It also caused rampant fires to be started, so I had to get out there and fight them out in the open. The stress of battle was clearly too much for Chernoff because she let out a psychic shriek, drawing in a bunch of entities and incapacitating the entire colony, after which a black man, I mean a man in black, came to help out the colony. The colonists got up themselves almost immediately though, while the man in black was being attacked by a side stealer Chernoff attracted. As if things weren't bad enough, right after this the third wave of imps arrived from the same direction, killing the side stealer and kidnapping the man in black before he even reached the base. The imps also kidnapped the two meat shields that were sent to help with the imp attacks, so that was totally fine with me. Bye bye dudes, and thanks for the masterwork nerf spiker. The device would stun small non-mechanoid enemies for a very short amount of time, which could be useful. At the end of it all, nobody I cared about was left with any permanent damage, which was certainly very lucky. When recovering from the rampant infections on all my colonists due to many burns, a side stealer snuck into the base and started slashing at Mr. Cook in his sleep, which would be one hell of a way to greet the day, I'll tell you that much. Certainly more effective than a morning coffee. 
It was at this point that our animal husbandry started to get up to speed as well, since we captured two horses a while ago. One male and one female. Like Noah, as God intended. Luckily for us, the first offspring was female, so time for rampant incest. Again, as God intended. With horses get, we could travel much faster than on foot. After everyone recovered from the impid's triple assault, a bunch of cultists came to the colony to try and abduct one of my colonists using a ritual. Unfortunately for them, I had guns. And they did not. So bamo blamo, they all dead. Though Mr. Cook did lose three toes on his left foot. Unfortunate, but we just have to get a replacement leg then. A few days later, it was in the middle of winter, and at this point in the playthrough, we'd mined a lot of the initial ore deposits. So after researching the ground penetrating scanner, we built the thing, so we'd never have a resource shortage. In this heart of winter, my colonists somehow managed to contract malaria. I guess the mosquitoes were just built differently here. Though, to throw my colonists a bone, a chat trader who had a quota to fill showed up, selling us a shield belt. Very nice. But more importantly, we got a quest from the Empire, where they offered us a drill arm for Miss Miner, which would make her so much more effective. And all we had to do was kill off a few wasters, carrying nothing but tox grenades. As you might have been able to guess, it wasn't very effective. We managed to capture one prisoner, which we nabbed to execute for culture points. Though unfortunately for him, some of my flesh creatures orchestrated an escape plan and started beating the shit out of him, while he was still injured, making his suffering before death even worse. In light of this recent escape attempt, we upgraded the door to increase security, making it much harder for the entities to escape. Speaking of security, with my colonists having not much to do during the winter, I decided we'd procrastinate at making a rudimentary choke point for far too long, so we made a small corridor and installed some auto cannons. To finance a lot of our stuff, we were living off making good quality dusters to sell, which was, besides organ harvesting and later brain scan sales, plenty enough to keep our economy afloat. With the choke point nearing completion, I started issuing quality flak helmets to our colonists, so that at least their grey matter would stay intact. This was because we were planning on fighting Diabolus soon to unlock the next and most important tier of mech tech. But first, we were offered a quest to take care of Itakins for an orbital bombardment targeter, which I thought could be handy against later larger Diabolus fights. So I accepted it and got 8 pieces of cannon fodder. But oh boy would this be irritating. You see, the Itakin raid was a siege raid, and we didn't have any mortars or shield packs. They, however, did, so we couldn't attack them because we'd get absolutely destroyed by their sniper rifles and shield bubbles. In the entirety of all my RimWorld campaigns, I have never had to suffer through a siege, so I figured, okay, they'll just shell me for a little while until they run out of ammo, but no, they just kept getting resupplied again and again. I kid you not, they shelled the base for about three days. In the evening of the third day, they finally couldn't take standing around anymore, so they charged the choke point. Unsurprisingly, they didn't stand much of a chance against our overwhelming firepower, no matter how good their armor might have been. When the enemy retreated, I made sure to have everyone gang up on one guy with a shield pack, and back alley beat the shit out of him to steal it from him. Unfortunately, we beat him so goddamn hard that he just straight up died, resulting in us being unable to salvage his armor. Because apparently our colonists were above wearing armor of the dead. The stress once again was too much for Chernoff, and she went off to try and kill a captured entity. Again. So we put her in the timeout zone, which was exactly where she was going to go anyways. But I guess being manhandled by a stranger from another faction was distracting enough for her to not think about killing entities anymore. At the end of it all, we got our grubby little mitts on more mortars and mortar components than we'd ever feasibly use. So in the end, this whole ordeal turned out pretty nicely for us. While recovering and repairing our base from that attack, a quest popped up where we had to sell 5 flag pants to a local settlement, which would give us a bionic leg so we could finally replace the 3 missing toes of Mr. Cook. Because that's not overkill. Just lop off his leg to replace a few toes. But before doing that, I was really yearning to increase my mech tech, so I summoned Diabolus. The first call in is never that tough, just one Diabolus you can gang up upon, plus three Militors. Easy peasy. 
The fight didn't really go exactly according to plan, though. Before anything, Diabolus sniped one of my three Militors with its Plasma Blaster. After that, Diabolus started charging up its spooky cannon just out of range of our EMP grenades, leading to us having to run away. Our mech lords charged in with a basic spear like an absolute madman. Though to his credit, this severely limited Diabolus' ability to fight. So then the rest of our colony just ganged up around him and started to unload their hot lead all over Diabolus' body. With Diabolus defeated, we recovered a special chip and would soon unlock some very useful combat mechs. With the research for that underway, I placed down a frenzy inducer near our fabrication lab, which made use of the flesh creature's powers to make our colonists work 50% faster. A huge boon indeed, but the drawback would be that everyone near it basically received the aggressive trait, where every mental break would be violent. Oh well, I like efficiency. This'll not get annoying at all later on. It was around this time that I was really starting to torment my captive flesh creatures. I'd installed a bioferrite harvester a little while ago, which I can only assume draws their blood containing the illustrious bioferrite, so I can make things like walls and chairs and assault rifles out of their blood. I also installed an inhibitor which requires no power and calms down any entity within its radius, even through walls. But the real fun stuff was the electro harvester. This little beauty sucks ionic energy from the entities and turns it into electricity while searing their flesh and organs in the process. Nice. Really fulfills my sadistic tendencies, hearing them scream in agony every now and again. At this time, my colonists were getting real cranky about not getting a neural supercharge every single day, which increased their efficiency, sure, but also slurps power like nobody's business. This meant I had to build two whole extra water wheels just to supply my five colonists with their filthy pleasure. With that done, I had greed. Greed for more money. So realizing that my chronic energy problems weren't bad enough already, I built myself a hydroponics bay to grow psychoid plants, because supplying the ring with flake would be one of the least morally reprehensible things we would do. So time to get cooking. Burning with curiosity, I couldn't help myself from exploring one of the two ancient dangers in this sector. What could be inside? Forbidden knowledge? Sweet loot? More recruits? Hostile mechs? Hmm, all scorches, eh? After taking care of the problem, I got my hands on a biomutation pulsar, which we'd not use for a very long time. It's a good thing too, because it'll horrifically mutate any animal in the sector into disgusting flesh creatures. The two survivors weren't very good, so I opted to harvest their organs for a quick buck. Bet that wasn't what they were expecting when they entered those pots, huh? But I have a flesh crisis to resolve, so... Thank you for your contribution to the cause? Right after this, the High Stellark of the Shattered Empire practically begged me to take a mysterious cargo off his hands for a measly 62 plasteel. Though I had curiosity, so I accepted the quest anyways and got a Revenant Spine. This thing I could either smash or capture, so naturally I went for the safe option and captured it, just to see what it was. So I first... <clears throat> Uh, euthanized one of our other test subjects to make space for the Revenant and ugh, that thing looks creepy. It definitely needs to be contained well since it turns invisible when loose and hypnotizes colonists, whom can only be freed by killing the Revenant. Sounds like fun, no? It'll definitely not cause problems for us. Following the Revenant's capture, we built a long-range mineral scanner since we were nearing fabrication and were running low on components. I also purchased an armor skin gland and an Arcotech eye, the former I installed in Chernoff and the latter in Mr. Cook. And remember how I said that that Revenant would definitely not cause problems for us? Well, the fucker almost immediately escaped confinement, right after I installed Mr. Cook's Arcotech eye. Luckily for us, it didn't hypnotize anyone when it fled, though we did not have long to prepare for its inevitable attack, so I equipped a bioferrite flare pack I made some time ago for this exact eventuality, to turn it visible for a short period of time. Not even 9 hours later, it showed itself. We were alerted of its presence by our proximity detector. The thing immediately hypnotized Mechlord and thus turned off our Militor firepower. 
the rest of the colonists unloaded on it, but it just wouldn't die. The thing was freakishly tough and fast despite its many injuries. Luckily, thanks to the flare pack, we managed to stay on its trail while the nerve spiker stunned it for just long enough so that it couldn't get away. When it was put down, it gooed all over the place, leaving a small puddle of black ooze behind. Groovy. Not learning our lesson one bit, we immediately brought the spine back to the containment area and chained it up once more. Changing nothing. With the Revenant safely returned to its confines, we were forced to call in another Diabolus, since we needed two of their chips to make a bandwidth pack, which would give Maclord 9 extra bandwidth on top of his current 6. This time his entourage would be a little spicier, containing 4 Militors and 2 Pikemen. The Militors were no problem, since they were getting stunned by our EMP grenades, and the Pikemen couldn't aim for shit, and even if they'd hit, they'd do no damage. Though Diabolus did manage to blow up my two turrets, which was sloppy on my part. Nevertheless, the second chip was now ours. While sending Mrs. Miner out to get us some much needed components, the Revenant escaped again. Finally somewhat learning our lesson, we upgraded the floors inside the containment unit to Bioferrite, because the entities find it soothing or something. We also upgraded Bioferrite weaponry, so we immediately ordered up a few AKs with flamethrower under barrels. That same day we also held a dance-off, after which we chose Human Primacy, so that our crafter tail would make masterwork and legendary quality stuff far more often, increasing the value of our duster industry. To make the still at large revenant situation worse though, the impits attacked not long after its escape, and since they were breachers and didn't seem to care about my natural walls, ransacked my storeroom. They took a few resources, an unusable psi power, and the orbital bombardment targeter with them. Mostly luxury items, nothing crucially needed, but nevertheless still pretty autistic to lose. One of the imps also made off with our shield belt, but, extremely luckily, the Revenant stopped them, so we could retrieve the stupid thing. And our shield belt. It had been six days since the Revenant escaped, and fearing hypnotic death, nobody besides the mechs were allowed outside, since the Revenant didn't seem to care about our bots. Though in the evening of the sixth day, it slipped into the base and hypnotized Tail before escaping. We tried to follow and stun the thing, but it was too quick for us to keep up with. We followed its scratch mark until we stopped at the river. Tossing a few flares around resulted in nothing, so we were forced to turn back empty-handed. Now, we were stuck inside the base for another few days while quickly running out of meaningful work to do. Maglord did however start the gestation of two proper battle mechs. We'd also discovered most of the low tier flash monsters and other entities, so after killing the Revenant some time later, we sent Chernoff to activate the spooky monolith, which turned into a spooky glowing monolith, awakening a raging machine intelligence. It would now allow for far greater threats to start assaulting us, but this was a good thing you see, because to fully activate the monolith to stop the threat and study it in peace, we needed to discover a whole heap of advanced different entities, including some weird ones. The machine intelligence, showing its displeasure at our meddling, immediately opened up a pit to hell itself, from which big flash monsters would crawl out of. We would not close that hole for a while, so better get used to it being in our backyard. Luckily this time around there was a trade caravan nearby, so the threat was easily taken care of. To help combat this new threat we manufactured two scythers, which were far superior melee combatants compared to squishy feeling organics. Even if these beautiful machines were to get destroyed, we could just simply toss their remains into a mech tank with just a little bit of steel, and they'd be up and running in no time. The machine intelligence wasn't done with us yet, however, because it started to reanimate the dead all around us. So once again, we were confined to our base, which was now also starting to run low on resources. The reanimated corpses weren't too much of a threat to the base, but if one were to go outside, they'd quickly get overwhelmed by a forming horde of angry zombies. The stay inside and hide doctrine worked like a charm and besides the occasional deer being resurrected over and over again to in turn be put down by our mechs over and over again, we didn't have too much trouble. With the death ball clearing, the zombies would flop over dead in about a day or so later. Hooray! We could finally get things done again after having been locked inside the base for a few days on end. 
The game did feel sorry for our misfortune and sent us a gift from the skies. Anita Kin, whose prosthetic arm, kidney, liver and asthmatic lung we harvested. Some lung donor sure was in for one hell of a surprise. Oh well, we don't do returns in this colony. During our nuclear fallout shelter practice we hadn't been sitting still though and now we had two scorchers on their way. I figured they'd be particularly useful against the flesh monsters since they didn't seem to appreciate fire very much. With our expanded mech army and an insatiable hunger for more laborers, the entities must have been rubbing off on me, we opened up the second ancient danger to find some grotesque flesh monsters inside. But now we were armed with flamethrower mechs and flamethrower AKs, so they were easily dispatched. When mopping up the remaining flesh monsters, we accidentally opened up the crypto sleep caskets containing some less than cooperative occupants. Though we were fortunate enough to spot two subjects that would be viable for joining our colony. So we used our psychic shock lance on them, only slightly damaging Brass's brain, but it was still good for use. We also beat the hell out of shield pack man, so that's another get out of jail free card for us. When going inside to clear the remaining four ancients, they were just sort of standing there, menacingly, letting us have our filthy way with them. I'll take it, thank you. We also captured Witch who had a revenant spine built into her own, allowing her to temporarily turn invisible without the use of psionics, though you can't spam this one unlike psionics. Not long after this, a waste pack infestation showed up. Irritating, but far out of the way. I'd ignore it for now. As if my labor prayers had been heard, another colonist just sort of showed up at our front door. So just like Chernoff, I figured that's eh, so good, even if he has a secret, what's the worst that can happen? Three days after her capture, Witch decided to join the colony. A very welcome addition to the labor force and an excellent marksman. Very useful indeed. It was great timing too, because not two hours later, a mech raid with a thermite wall breacher showed up, so it was all hands on deck for this one. We camped the rock just outside the base to prevent damage to said base. The EMP grenades once again came in clutch, though a poor little hauler bolt got caught in the crossfire. Poor little guy just wanted to perform some menial labor for us. Look at how they massacred my boy! My boy! Besides that unfortunate incident, everything else seemed to go smoothly. That was until the second Fausto got hit. He screeched some fears like your average Fortnite child, so we did the only sensible thing and put him down. It was the only choice. Well, that was a perfectly good gear set down the toilet. He wore it for what? A day? What a waste. Thinking nothing of the autistic screeching he did, we just went on with our duties until... Oh look, a side stealer! And there are, oh, there are a lot more side stealers, oh, down there as well. And holy shit, woman, run! Everyone, run to the max, it's our only chance! Oh god, she's screwed, don't look, don't look! No, churn off the crawl towards them! Phew, man, that was a close one. If it weren't for our bots, I don't think we'd have survived that, proving once more that the machines will ultimately reign supreme. This ordeal unfortunately did cost Churn off a finger though. What a shame for her. With everyone still wounded and royally pissed off at being in pain, the pit shat out some more flesh creatures, and even though we were funneling them quite nicely down the killing tunnel, many of my colonists still weren't in any condition or nearby enough to fight. So, like a true aristocrat, I threw a bunch of plebs at my enemies to solve my problems. I would make for great royalty. Oh, you thought that was it with all the crises at once? No, 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 no. Right after this, Neanderthals, and I'm starting to run low on functional mechs, people, and just options in general. They did give us some time to prepare at least, and there was one particular Neanderthal that piqued my interest. Panther. Brawler, nimble, kind, and a high melee skill with plant work on the side. When the battle commenced, our remaining scyther went down immediately, but our saving grace was our flamethrowers and that the enemy was coming in real slowly after they got distracted with smashing apart my shit. 
shooting them up some real good, those scumbags, as a last insult, killed my poor Roomba. Why, ya dicks? But hey, at least the one Neanderthal I wanted has shown up on our doorstep. Don't mind if I do. I'll take him as compensation for Mr. Cook's now missing leg. Oh man, we need a breather. Unfortunately, Panther did get horrifically burned on his left side and had his left arm and leg burned off. It would be expensive to get him up and running. <laughs> but I decided I couldn't pass up such a good melee combatant. With the amount of corpses building up rapidly, it was decided that our hauler bots would cart off a bunch of corpses to the harbinger trees on the other side of the river, where we'd also been dumping all of our toxic waste. After consuming enough corpses, the trees could be cut down for a nice extra influx of bioferrite, since we never seemed to have enough of the stuff. Also, which equipped a psychic insanity lance that in combination with her flak helmet looked a lot like a Pickelhaube, which I found amusing. I also noticed that the waste pack infestations didn't seem to get triggered by mechanoids walking up to them. Yet another advantage our cold machines had over organics. During our breather we also recruited Brass. These ancients really don't need much convincing to join your colony. I guess waking up hundreds of years later left them without purpose, which we could provide. With only very minor brain damage and good skills, he would be a welcome addition to the labor pool. We had been on the rim for almost exactly two years now, and our industry was coming along splendidly, though our entity codex was looking kind of empty, so we still had plenty of difficult entities to encounter. To be prepared for this, we summoned the War Queen, to be able to build our final mechs and upgrade our bandwidth once more. The War Queen's entourage wasn't anything crazy. The pikemen really aren't ever a problem when they attack, and the scythers were getting body blocked by our wall of mechs. Popping one of our handful of shield packs, we dealt with the entourage, after which we rushed the War Queen down. Though I forgot to turn off the auto fire of the uranium slug turrets, so we ended up doing way more damage to ourselves than the War Queen would ever have been able to do. No matter though, destroyed mechs are easily and cheaply replaced. With the War Queen destroyed, we got our hands on a very good tier of mech tech, and we'd also be able to make our very own Diabolus, the ultimate weapon to carve our way through flesh beast hordes, like a hot knife through butter. Right after fending off a fox attack, the Revenant Spine, which we just unceremoniously turfed into our storage, was humming, threatening to come back to life once more. So we temporarily put it back in its familiar surroundings, though with us expanding our base, I decided to allocate a portion to individual containment cells to finally, properly contain dangerous entities. Before the new prison cell was even complete, the rate of 40 Militors came in to have a go. Even when funneled through our kill box, there were just too damn many of them. So I slammed the panic button and popped the shield back to prevent unnecessary loss of limes. With the new prison cell complete, we carted the Revenant over to its new forever home, where it would never cause problems ever again. Surely. While recovering from the three subsequent attacks, a bunch of travelers decided it'd be a good idea to walk towards the weird alien egg-shaped objects. When will you people learn? Anyway, since we relied so much on fire, the bugs didn't stand a chance, and now we had plenty of otherwise unusable meat to turn into kibble for our animals. Almost nothing went to waste in this here colony. Directly following this, while the base construction was going along well, we recruited Panther. Besides his traits, Panther was also a Neanderthal, which means that he had genes that boosted his melee skills even further, making him the almost perfect organic melee combatant. Now if only he had the tough trait as well. A man can dream. Completing the War Queen research, we could finally see what we needed to produce our very own Diabolus. We basically needed only two ingredients, two Diabolus chips and a scrambled brain. So we immediately summoned another Diabolus threat. Still not having learned my lesson, the Uranium Slug turrets minced only a few of our mechs, but in the end nothing of value was lost. Making good use of the EMP grenades as usual, its entourage didn't do a whole lot for him, and getting slashed in the face by our one-armed and legged Neanderthal really messed up its day. 
At the same time, we researched bionics, which would allow us to not only cope with limb loss, but would straight up improve our people with superior robotic parts. The more flesh we left behind, the more we looked like our mechs, and the stronger we became. Now, we only needed to kill one more Diabolus. In light of our recent kill box almost disasters, I decided to upgrade the thing somewhat, adding a stronger funnel. I really should have just revamped the whole thing, but I had laziness, you see. During our many ongoing construction efforts, the sky had begun to dim as well. Soon, everything would be shrouded in darkness, where we'd only be safe in the light. Maybe people on the rim had very good cause to be afraid of the dark, so we started installing lights everywhere, like we were playing Alan Wake, the good one. Hacken, fearing the impending darkness, decided that now was maybe a good time to finally submit and join us as our last recruit, so that he too could at least arm himself against the coming darkness. In the darkness, these necrolyphs sprouted up, which we had to destroy in order to lift this darkness. Dispelling the darkness with flares, we took the entire colony, including mech army, into the unknown. Well, that was easy. Let's just shoot it and be done with it and uh oh. Knock dolls have started sprouting up everywhere, all around us. Quick, get the flamethrowers ready. Something that thrives in the darkness is surely unappreciative of light and flames. Microing the hell out of my flamethrowers and melee combatants, we easily took care of the Noctols. With plenty of them bleeding out on the floor, we captured a bunch of them to study for advanced research. In the capturing frenzy excitement, however, we kind of forgot. forgot to finish off the necrolith. Whoops. With the flares having burned out, I decided to take Mechlord with his mech entourage over to the necrolith to finish it off. We lit the way with the flames from the Scorchers to not get hurt by the darkness, don't starve style. I would however regret starting those fires since apparently it wouldn't rain during this darkness, so the fires just kept spreading out of control, burning down a bunch of my hydroelectric power plants. This created terrible problems where our lights would just keep flickering on and off, so triaging our power consumption to the bare minimum, we managed to keep the lights on. Having destroyed this necrolith, two more popped up elsewhere. The first one we attacked sent a lot of Noctols our way and seriously beat up one of our scythers. But other than that, it went so right-ish. After a short recovery period, we approached the third necrolith and, once again, we were beset by Noctols. Though, due to the rock and structure layout, they had a pretty hard time swarming us. With them out of the way, the third necrolith was history, and the darkness lifted. This event was thus far, by far, the hardest. Partially due to my own pyromania, but still. With this long-lasting distraction behind us, it was time to call Diabolus over for brunch one last time for the final chip we needed. But this time they really weren't messing around. Two Diaboli with built-in shields, a Centurion emitting a large shield, two Legionaries with medium shields and an ass ton of Militors. Bogging them down with melee combatants, including the Scorchers to beat them with their stubs, we finally managed to kill them both. One of them getting awfully close to shooting its cannon, which would have definitely been real unhealthy for us. But I was ready to deploy a shield pack if the EMP grenades lost the ability to stun them. During this battle, a few people lost some limbs, which was actually a good thing since this meant Upgrades, people! Upgrades! With the chips in hand, now all we needed was a human brain, which we would scramble and shove into our mech to serve as its CPU. After a few days, my prayers for brains had been answered, since a bunch of tribals showed up. When they were routed, we beat the ever-living shit out of some of them. With plenty of scramblable brains get, I threw a fat tosser into the rip scanner immediately. At long last, we had the makings for our very own Diabolus to vaporize the flesh monsters. Though it would take some time before his gestation would be complete. The rest of our captives we harvested for organs, followed by us rip-scanning their brains. Such great value! 
because at this point Maclord was wearing a gamer headset for more bandwidth, we made a stone skin gland for him to make him very hard to kill, even without the helmet on. Getting real sick of the pit to hell sharting out attacks in our backyard, it was decided to finally plug it, once and for all. Together we descended into the pit to find it overgrown with disgusting flesh. To collapse the pit we had to find a dread melt as it was called. But first we doused a few monsters in holy flame and killed the offspring that popped out of them. There were also some insects here which was peculiar. Really would have expected them to have killed each other by now but I guess not. With those creatures taken out we had to carve our way through the flesh to find the dreadmelt. But we got pretty lucky because the first route we decided to clear was where the thing was hiding. The thing bled flesh monsters. As we blew off chunks those chunks started to attack us. A truly nightmarish creature. Luckily for us we had plenty of fire to spare and the cave system functioned as a natural kill shaft. Sending our bots in first to keep our cyborg safe, we only had one scyther get down. When the dreadmelt popped for the final time, the pit immediately started to collapse. So Panther nabbed the downed scyther in his arms as we collectively made our way to the pit's exit, clearing flesh monsters blocking our way. Since the scyther was too heavy to carry up with us, Maclord made a few emergency repairs to its propulsion systems, after which we all made it safely out of the pit. Only a few hours later, the pit was history. Seeing the effectivity of dousing the flesh monsters in flames, I decided we had enough bandwidth left for a centipede with a long range napalm launcher. I also still wanted one more scyther to hold the line of our army, so we had a few 5G towers erected in a few of our colonists bedrooms. I'm sure they didn't mind having those radio waves being drilled directly into their brains as they slept. With our max gestating and us having been on this ring world for over 3 years at this point, I figured we'd start pissing off the already cheesed off void, so we could discover more entities to work our way towards the endgame. We didn't have to wait long for a warped obelisk to arrive, which we could suppress from reaching some activity. Not caring about what this thing might do, we threw a party, which gave us enough ideology points to pick the supremacist meme. Now our people would finally not give a damn about corpses littering the streets. Which seemed fitting, getting desensitized to death with all the murdering and worse things we'd been doing in the name of progress and all. With us actively provoking the void, we started the creation of cost effective recon and locust armor so that our cyborgs would be far less likely to die. Feeling excited about the void provocations, Tail and Brass decided to get married. The only lovers in this entire colony, which mega blue since more couples would have meant fewer bedrooms. Oh well, better late than never I suppose. With that we... Oh look, the Revenant got out again! Somehow, despite its heavily reinforced private room, I'm not salty or anything, what are you talking about? Demonstrating our enormous power increase since its last escape however, we managed to kill it before it even left the base. Now, I swear, it'll never be a problem again. Preparing for the end game, we upgraded the kill box once more, but I didn't revamp it completely because laziness. I just sort of figured it would be good enough to get the job done. During construction we received a distress call, so we went to investigate and what in death's name is that? Look at this place, it's overgrown with flesh! Ugh, let's clear it out and see if we can snag anything worth a damn. First we filled in a few small pits from which flesh monsters could emerge. After that we cleared out the place room by room, where we found a decent recon helmet, a corpse and a bionic leg. Sweet! After clearing the rest of the flesh, we found nothing else of value. Not long after we returned home, the spooky obelisk activated and teleported four of our colonists away to some unknown labyrinth. Inside we found all sorts of things. Harbinger trees, a mega sloth, corpses, the usual. 
There were many doors to open here, most of which had to be forced to open, which took a while to do. Nevertheless, this advanced anomaly was super easy and we had already found the exit mere hours after we were sucked in here. Scoffing at the Void's pitiful attempt to try and stop us, we immediately provoked it right after. This time around the rain turned red like blood, turning everyone caught in it extremely hostile. So we quickly built a roof over our animals and restricted everyone to the confines of the base. Except for our mechs of course, god those things rule. Unfortunately Panther stood out in the rain for like 10 seconds and was immediately pushed over the edge, going on a murdering rampage, holding a very scary monosword. So we used the silence on him and told him to cool it. Oh look, no brain damage. Lucky you, I <laughs> bet Brass was feeling jealous. Unfortunately the seriously cheesed off wildlife did attack our worker bots, followed by all of the critters on the entire map making a mad dash directly to the base, which was a good thing. See, all the animals behaved as if they had Scaria, but they didn't, so we could just harvest them for all their worth. What an efficient hunt! As soon as it began, the blood rain led up within a day, so honestly, this event was just a restock of our fridge's meat supply. To what I can only attribute to his brain damage, Brass decided in all his wisdom to walk into a waste bag infestation immediately after being allowed to leave the base. After killing the kibble father, we ran over to him as he was crawling his way towards the base. With everyone going absolutely apeshit with their constant mental breaks, Journal first, then Brass followed by Mechlord and Mr. Cook, I had enough of the violent nature of them and turned off the frenzy inducer forever. At least the centipede finally finished. Now we just had to wait a little while longer for Diabolus and one last scyther. With the centipede under our command we provoked the void once more, after which almost immediately someone found the Brussels near the river. Chernoff immediately got obsessed by the damn thing, but I was confident that within a few days we'd have investigated the anomaly and that we could just yeet it into Mount Doom. Not fearing the cube at all, we just unceremoniously tossed it into our storage room. Shortly after the cube's arrival, the last scyther was completed. Now we just had to wait for Diabolus, who still had to keep cooking in its little tube for another day or two. Also, Chernoff's obsession grew from strange to worrying when she started crafting little cube replicas all over the place every now and again. Not knowing whether this replica would make her condition worse, or god forbid cause other colonists to fall under its corrupting influence, we had Mechlord shoot it from a safe distance. Uh, the cube, I mean. Unintimidated by the presses, we provoked the void once more where Brass's corpse showed up. Slightly spooking, but in the end not threatening at all. But then, at long last, Diabolus was complete. Now I felt like we could take on anything the Void might throw at us, because now we were in possession of the ultimate flash melting weapon. With the two peculiar objects going on at the same time, a Void researcher, as she claimed, showed up at our doorstep to supposedly help. Feeling insulted as if we couldn't figure these things out on our own, we told her to piss off. After which she got pissed off. Subduing her with bullets, we harvested her organs, after which we performed a scientific ritual, where we sucked out her life force and put it into Mechlord, de-aging him from 31 to 19 years old. This synergized extremely well with transhumanists, because now he didn't have to sit in a little pot for days on end. Feeling young and spry again, we provoked the void once more, after which a band of chimeras materialized. When they attacked, the chimeras were unable to even reach our cyborgs, since the wall of mechs made them physically unable to reach them. Twas a thing of beauty, the Scorchers dousing the area in flames, the Centipede doing the same, the Diabolus vaporizing anything, including our plastial walls, that got in range or too close to him. On top of that, the AK's flamethrowers burnt all that came too close. The only annoying part was that a few of them attacked my expensive, but effectively worthless turrets. 
Oh well. Right after this, we resolved Brass's corpse situation where we just stomped it underneath our boot. Talk about an anti-climax. We also ripped out Bellamy's brain right after. Feeling confident that nothing would threaten our ultimate victory, we provoked the Void once more, which, unbeknownst to me, lured an ugly as the night flesh monster person hybrid over to us. Not wanting to take in more colonists, let alone one so ugly, we told them to sod off, after which he turned hostile, so we killed him. Out of his chest bursted a metal horror, which, had we taken the guy in, would have quietly spread among all our cyborgs. Sending the squad to help Mechlord, we killed the thing, along with the resurrected monster. And again, and again, and again, until he stopped getting up again. Four years into this colony, we finally had our first marriage, between Tail and Brass, which freed up an extra room for us. With everyone having gained a substantial mood boost, we'd better hurry with triggering the endgame crisis while they didn't get mental breaks. When looking at the codex, it seemed like we'd encountered almost all entities at this point, and we didn't need all of them to activate the monolith. Following the last provocation, the monolith sent the by far worst creatures our way. The Devourer. These annoying little shits lurch towards and eat your guys, including Max, dealing damage to them and rendering them unable to fight. To make matters worse, the killbox layout worked to their advantage, completely circumventing Diabolus's death cannon. Luckily, when we unloaded our flamethrowers, they belched out our guys and were also temporarily unable to fight back. These things were quite hearty, however, and didn't just want to lie down and die already. After some struggle, we finally defeated them. If we encountered them once, surely we wouldn't encounter them again, so we wouldn't need to change the kill box at all. It was also at this point that Brass 2 succumbed to the allure of the cube and started making imitations as well. After all, why not? Why should I? A few days after the Devourer raid, a massive mech raid showed up, including three Diaboli and a heap of support bots as well. Seeing how much difficulty we had dealing with the last Diabolus raid, I pressed the panic button and activated the Biomutation Pulsar, twisting and turning the local wildlife into horrific flesh monsters. Many of these monsters weren't cat piss either and were quite dangerous, resulting in most of the mechs getting destroyed or seriously damaged by the monsters. Or friendly fire. Diabolus on Tesseron, Diabolus on Pikeman, Diabolus on Diabolus. By the end there was just very little left and what was left didn't survive long. One of the Diaboli even died to tough spikes. How pitiful. With that threat taken care of, the road was clear to activate the spooky glowing monolith to almost full power. Maglord had the honor of flipping the switch, after which we were notified that we had awoken something terrible. Void towers would pop up around the colony, which we had to give a good old stroken to fully activate the monolith. We also wouldn't see daylight again for some time, if ever. The void structures were being guarded by the very tough metal horrors, and to make matters worse, the entire surrounding area became infested with noctals and flash monsters, the latter immediately commencing an attack. Now, nobody would leisurely leave the base again. The basic flash monsters melted like snow in the sun. We just set the little poops on fire and watched them run around aimlessly. If only those were the only thing we had to deal with. In our hubris, we attacked the first tower without our mechs, but we underestimated the heartiness of the metal horrors, which we would have barely dealt with if not for the interference of the normal flesh monsters. We barely made it, making good use of our jump packs, but we now had to lick our wounds for a few days during this most hostile time. On top of that, we also lost our mono sword to the flames. With the cyborg safely back inside, we still needed to activate the tower. So Mechlord took his mechanized entourage's bodyguards and rubbed the tower real good. This in turn triggered a massive onslaught of entities, including the accursed devourers. Being caught out in the open, it became a terrible fight for survival. 
most of the mechs went down, including the centipede in Diabolus, which meant we had to spend a few more days inside the base recuperating. Not wanting to repeat our previous mistake, we chucked an anti-grain mortar shell to the second tower, which lured the metal horrors to us. This was most excellent since fighting them out in the open ended in disaster last time. The hurt survivors were quickly taken care of as they came in one by one. With them taken out, we marched on the second tower with the entire organic squad so we could quickly run away. Mechlord had the honor of activating it. With this tower active, we lost what little light we had remaining. Plus, yet another huge counterattack. This time including an enormous horde of reanimated corpses. It was here that Diabolus got his big moment to shine, because after we took care of most gore hulks, he incinerated almost a dozen zombies every time he shot. Several times. What a glorious sight. While waiting for three more towers to spawn, it had to be right now, not any other time but now, that we could finally toss the press us into Mount Doom. Because this would undoubtedly piss off Chernoff and Brass, we preemptively tossed them in jail, where, after beating some sense into them, they were ready to join us in Sanity Land again. When utter blackness fell upon us, the final three Void Towers materialized, close by as well. The first tower's guards immediately attacked us due to its close proximity. After that, Maglord activated the tower, which again resulted in a huge attack being triggered, including the accursed devourers, again. The Gorhulks, however, didn't fare very well, coming into close range of us with fires being started everywhere and all. That shit sure must have smelled. Ready for the next wave, we threw our last anti-grain shell at the fourth tower, after which the few remaining survivors were quickly taken out. With Maglord needing his beauty sleep, <laughs> Tail had the honor of activating this tower, after which we quickly retreated using our jump packs. The retaliatory attack was devourers again! Why did it have to be devourers again? After that, we slaughtered our way through even more core hulks, no problem. Really putting the Diabolus burn on them this time. After licking our wounds for the final time, we lured the guards of the final tower to us using normal mortar shells. We were ready to face what would come next, and made our way to the final tower. After Maglord activated this final tower, the mother of all assaults broke loose. We quickly retreated to the base to deal with the incoming threat, but zombies forced a breach into our living quarters. Oh shit! Through this breach, the entities were flooding into the base. We tried to force them back, but there were just too damn many of them flooding in. We left most mechs at the kill box to hold that front, and brought all our cyborgs and scythers with us to try and force the entities back. During this, the monolith fully activated, allowing us to interface with it. This could be our only chance to make it out of this thing alive, so we left the scythers in the base's corridors to hold off the enemy onslaught. Our cyborgs ran past the mech battle line, covering us against an incoming horde, which allowed Hakin with his genetic speed to reach the monolith, while he was being covered by his comrades. With everyone fighting for their lives in our reality, Hakin was transported to the Void Nexus, where he resisted the Void's call to merge with it and severed its link between our worlds. With the link severed, Hakin was transported back into our world, where all the entities dropped dead in an instant. With their link to the Void severed, they became nothing more than the cancerous piles of flesh that they truly were. Our colonists fought like hell, most of them were seriously injured, and some of them were even incapacitated on the floor. But, in the end, they were alive. With the Void Realm severed and the monolith destroyed, we had saved this world, and could now conduct our science in peace. We survived, and in no small part thanks to our mechanoid friends. Looking around, we could see how the darkness ravaged our colony. 
every animal was dead and all of the vegetation was gone. All that was left was a partially toxic wasteland. But given time, life would return. And soon, the unspeakable horrors of the void would become a distant memory.